Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen of YouTube and Chucky2009. I'm out here in the shop tonight with my buddy and co-star Wes aka Welding2012 and uh, tonight we're going to be talking about torch brazing which is an interesting process. It's something that a lot of people actually surprisingly don't know. Most, I don't know if most, but a lot of schools just don't teach this. But nonetheless, I feel like it's a very good skill to have. Now the difference between torch brazing and torch welding or electric welding or any other welding process for that matter is that, well, think about when you weld something. You take your two pieces of metal normally and you take some filler metal and you use an electric arc to heat all those three things up until they run into a puddle and when that solidifies they are one piece of metal. You know, you get your two pieces of base metal hot enough that they melt and then they melt together. Now with the brazing, it doesn't quite work like that. We don't actually melt anything together. What happens is we take these uh, the electrodes for lack of a better term. These are 332nd inch flux coated bronze rods. Hobart brand. I picked these up at the local tractor supply. They're, they run acceptably well. You can pick them up just about, just about anywhere. I'm sure you can get these Rural King Farm and Fleet, places like that. And, uh, and what happens is these are obviously just bronze rods coated with flux and as opposed to melting everything together like we would in the weld, all we're doing is we're heating up our pieces of base metal and then we melt this bronze and it sticks. You know, it's not... Brazing isn't so much welding as it is gluing. It's, uh... And for that matter, it's a very good skill to have. It comes in handy in a lot of situations. It's good for cast iron. It's good for welding dissimilar metals because the metals can't not match up, you know, if you melt them together because you're not actually melting them together. But anyway, now I'm going to hand this over to Wes and we're going to talk about the equipment we're going to be using and uh, the torch setup and we'll go from there. Alrighty, so tonight we're going to be using a welding tip on a oxypropane, or oxyacetylene rig, excuse me. All good. So we've just got a basic welding tip on here. Um, most combination torches, you can take the cutting head off and put on one of these, these tips right here, just on the screws. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike electric welding, we're going to be using gases to get our heat to melt the bronze. So, in order to do that, we're going to need to dial in our tanks here. Um, if you're familiar with the cutting process with oxyacetylene, uh, you don't need quite as much gas flow. We're not really trying to cut away anything, so we're just going to crank this up. Yeah, we'll just say right in there ought to be good. <laughs> Come down here to acetylene. We'll find tune this at the torch, of course. Right, so as long as you have enough going to the torch, you can always adjust it there. Yeah. Right under, you know, 4 PSI is normally pretty good for that. What do you think, man? No more than like... 10, 15 on the oxygen yeah, side? Yeah, you, you really don't need much. No, uh, he's exactly you'll right. You'll see whenever we light the torch up, it's nothing like cutting, and you don't have that cutting jet of oxygen that's coming down. So mm -hmm. that's what really hogs the oxygen whenever you're you know, using the torch. Yeah. So that being said, we'll just come over here, get situated, find our clinch striker. Kind of get spoiled after taking MIG weld where you just kind of pull the trigger or push the pedal to get, get heat going. And you're off. Yeah. There's a little bit more of a, a trick or an art to setting a torch mm -hmm. than you might think because you can get a lot of different heats out of the same torch just based on your gas flow. About mid. Yeah, so I'm going to turn sense. this down. I can always, it's easier to turn the heat up than to turn it down without putting your flame out. So when your smoke starts to go like that, give it a little oxygen. Put it to a neutral flame. That's probably going to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. Kind of a low low heat seems to work better for these. It's a little more controllable. You don't have the foot pedal like the TIG. So then we're just going to come down here to our metal. Put on our shade fives. Uh huh. These are just uh, 14 gauge coupons, by the way. I'm just going to kind of heat this up to get all the moisture and stuff. You can see it drawing out of the plate. Mm hmm. Now we're going to kind of get this almost a cherry red before we start to add the brass. You have to be careful when you start adding the, the bronze, excuse me, here I go messing up again. Oh good. You, uh, it'll, it'll run all over if your plate gets too hot. So you want to try and keep the heat pretty pinpointed to where you want, want the filler to stay. So what you're saying is opposed to running hot and fast, you want to do this cold and slow. Right, and you'll see here I'm kind of dancing between these two plates to get them both evenly heated. Mm -hmm. We've got that color going on, so we're going to go ahead and introduce a little. It's kind of hard to really see what's going on because you got that flux that's melting. Now when you start to hear that sizzle, that's a good sign that you're too hot and you need to back off for a second. Because what that is, you're, you're actually burning the filler. Mm -hmm. You can control your heat input to an extent with just how far away you keep that flame. You 
you're just going to kind of dab, keep it nice and cool. This isn't the easiest thing in the world to see. It's kind of like when you're stick welding with 7014, 7024, something's going to put out a very heavy liquid slag coating. It looks like I'm getting a lot full into the top. Now this isn't going to give you a nice stack of dimes look like you would with TIG or something. Matter of fact, this one's starting to look pretty messy. I think I got a little too warm. That's all good. But and you know when it's too warm when it just kind of runs everywhere. Run all over and see we got this smoke here. We're obviously burning something we don't want to be burning. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to back off it for a second. So I got a big puddle of up there on top. I'm just going to back out, let it cool down, and then I'll come back in and start up again. Go back at it. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's not the end of the world. You can see we still got plenty of filler down in here if we needed to grind the top off or leave it. You know, okay. That's more just a aesthetics. Keep it looking nice and tidy. All right. Oh, shit. Now, in my opinion, you want to make sure you get plenty on there because this isn't a weld and it's not going to give you nearly the strength. So mm -hmm. be generous with the filler material. So what it's actually doing when these plates both get hot, it's going to draw that filler up underneath and in between the two plates. So if you were to cut these apart, you'd see a thin layer that's been kind of sucked up underneath there. Mm-hmm. Doing great, look at him go. He's being very careful to not get it too hot. Like anything, practice makes perfect. Now, generally you're not going to do a lot of this, so you're probably really never going to get to where you got it exactly figured out, because normally you do this on little repairs and things like that that you mm -hmm. just can't get a weld on. Yeah, he's right. Special circumstances like, uh, you know, cast iron that you don't want to put too much heat into, dissimilar metals. The example we heard in school was welding like a, well, you know, welding like a steel bracket to a cast iron housing or something. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's this kind of glossy, glass-like substance over our over our bead there and that is something that we're going to be removing <laughs> it's all good They're off the table. yeah and one thing i've learned you know you really don't want to dunk anything like this if it's an actual project because the rapid cooling will be, cause it to become a little bit more brittle however this is just a practice piece when you dunk it in water like that it does wonders to get that glass-like coating off No big weld for sure, but that is definitely a breeze. Not bad. So if I could critique my own work here a little bit um, mm -hmm. and do it again, I'd like to keep it a little bit cooler. And this up here on top is really not getting us anywhere, so it doesn't really need to be there. It's not hurting anything, but it doesn't necessarily need to be there. I'd like to see all this just stay right down in the joint, but you can't always get what you want. Nope. <laughs> cool. Well, hey, that's not bad at all. Definitely a breeze, no doubt about that. All right, well, what happens now? We got some more of these things and some more metal. I don't know if you want to... Hell, I'll weld one. Why not? All right, go for it. Cool. All right, YouTube. Uh, I have not done this since high school, my junior year of high school. But the good news is that I'm wearing two pairs of safety glasses, so it'll be all right. Ah, yeah. Okay, we're just going to here, following Wes's lead. I will vaporize all this moisture and whatnot from our plate. Oh, yeah, we're drawing it. 
It doesn't look like there's a lot that's going to fit between this upper and lower plate, but there's water popping out, and hopefully there's braids that's about to be popping back in. All right, the top plate's starting to glow, and the bottom plate's starting to glow. We have focus and everything. Yep. All right, that's a little hot. I wonder if we can do like a almost a lay wire technique with this. Oh, that seems to be kind of working. Biggest thing with almost any kind of welding is just play with it, make it your own, and figure out what works for yourself. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a huge price. Hey, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. That's exactly right. Better too much than too little, to an extent. This is kind of fun, YouTube, if nothing else. It's like oxyacetylene welding. It's rare for you to see it actually done, but that doesn't mean it's not a bad skill to have. Oh, yeah. All right, so what seems to be working for me, or you know, working, I do my air quotes, but I, my both hands are kind of tied up right now. Is mo I'm leaving this brazier rod in there a little bit more, like I said, almost like a lay wire technique. Uh, this isn't what Wes is doing, but maybe what Wes is doing would work for me if I practiced with it, and vice versa. I don't know. This is one of those things, you know. Like you said, your best bet is to try every possible way you can think of, find, research, and read about to accomplish this, and then just. And then just, you know, practice with it and see what works for you. I'm just going to switch over to this other braze rod here as I try to keep my puddle from completely cooling. Yeah, th this is a little bit different than a conventional weld in the sense that, you know, you have a smaller puddle. It's going to be easier to control. This is just kind of all over the place. I guess when it comes to controllability, one extreme would be TIG welding. You know, low amperage probably. And the other extreme would be, well, this. I'm going to start roasting my fingers off here in a minute or three. Yeah, this might not be a bad way to go. I want to try this on some cast iron. I don't know, YouTube, if you guys want to see this done on, done on some cast, just let me know. It's fun to play with, if nothing else. Alright, that's as far as I'm going. You're just kind of pushing the puddle along. So as you can see from this footage, uh, it kind of really just looks like a big mess when you're doing it. <laughs> That's not just the camera. You get that from the yeah, it really from the does look perspective like a big as well. Mess. It it really just kind of looks like it's running all over. And like I said, you really don't know what you got until you bust off that little coating and whatnot. Glass-like substance. Yeah, this is really cool, man. This was a good idea. Good idea. I hope you guys are enjoying this video. Alright, that's almost to the end. I'm just going to slowly pull away my heat. Don't want it to solidify too quickly. I'm going to shut the torch off. Alright. I'm just going to dunk this thing. Yeah, that, that right there alone popped off a lot of that glass-like substance, and the rest is going to come off a lot easier. I remember learning in high school that as soon as you're done welding and you go to chip your slag, uh, if it's still hot, it's still soft, and you're just banging on it, and it's just kind of forming and plasticky and doesn't really come off. I think your best bet, I know you can take it off while it's still hot, but if possible, I like to cool it down first. But that's just me. All right, let's see how we... Hmm. Well, it would appear as though I have some holes in mine. <laughs> yeah, like Wes was saying, it's just kind of a little bit everywhere, but... Tis brazing in all of its glory. With braze, you don't have a real fast-forming puddle like with steel, so... No. You've kind of got, you've got that heat kind of spread all over with the torch, so, it, like, like you said, it's, it's hard to get this ripple look, and I don't really know if you even need the ripple look, because it's more about getting it to draw in between the two plates, you can kind of see here on the end where it's started to suck back up underneath there, which is what you're after. But, 
That's a brace. That's a brace. Um, not probably something you're going to use every day, but if you're joining the similar metals, if you're working with cast iron, if heat and put is of utmost importance with like super thin stuff. I know back in high school, we built these like pirate ship things out of, that was like auto body It was like thickness. 22 gauge yeah, or like something. 20 something gauge. It was super thin stuff. And when we tried to oxyacetylene weld it, it didn't really go so well, so we just heated it up and braised it together. That's just one example. Thin material. Dissimilar metals, cast iron. Again, not something you're probably going to use every day. I'm sure someone out there does, but really fun to practice with. Really fun to, you know, just see what you can do. So anyway, this has been some form of brazing video. Anything you want to add there, Wes? Nope, I think we pretty much covered it all. Alright, awesomeness. Well, thanks for watching. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for more.